This is going to be Topic 50, Special Considerations in Trauma, Pediatrics. Key Concepts. Upon completion of this chapter, you'll be able to understand these concepts. Suspected injury patterns based on the mechanism of injury and kinematics. Pediatric head injuries. Unique pediatric spinal cord injuries. And unique pediatric thoracic injuries. Unintentional injury. Now, for pediatrics, it's the leading cause of death, and from ages 1 to 44, trauma or unintentional injury or accidents are the leading cause of death. Injury, uh, most common reason for assessing EMS for pediatric age group. Adults and children, pathophysiology of the injuries, there we're going to talk about the similarities and the differences. And then the injury types are going to be, uh, they're going to vary, and this is going to be based on uh, the patient's actual age whether they're a neonate, infant, toddler, and so on. <clears throat> Chief concerns. Adult and children may sustain multiple trauma. Following section uh, will highlight the differences based on the physiologic physiology of children. Injury patterns. Source of trauma varies by age group. Uh, mechanism of injury cause different injury patterns, and this is also based upon the age group, whether they went down and under, or up and over, or... Please look at the mechanism of injury. Severe injury response, major difference between children and adults. And that's going to be due to their physiology. Cervical spine and neck um, soft trauma injuries can result when other younger children are inappropriately restrained. So whenever we look at this, good chance if they had a sudden stop that that could do some devastating things to the child's C-spine. Trauma injuries, they include head injuries, neck and facial injury, spinal trauma, chest trauma, abdominal and genital urinary trauma, and then orthopedic trauma. Head injuries are the leading cause of traumatic death in children. Neck and facial injuries, um, discussed earlier in this chapter. We'll discuss a little bit about them too, especially a sublux injury. Uh, spinal trauma. Flexibility of the spine and supporting ligaments in children makes spinal fractures much less common in children than adults. Chest trauma. Children have a significant amount, significant amount of flexibility in their bony thorax, uh, so their chest is very, very pliable. They're more prone to internal injuries without signs of external injury at all. That's because the chest gives and it goes in and lacerates internal organs. Abdominal and genital urinary trauma. Much more complicated than adults, children tend to have less abdominal fat, weaker abdominal muscles, and their spleen and liver spends more time in their thoracic cavity. Orthopedic trauma, skeleton is much more flexible in young children than adults. Bone injuries in the pediatric population may be more incomplete injury rather than incomplete fractures, and we're talking about green sticks. So this is a sublux injury. Example of this, one vertebra slides into relationship to the one below it, compressing and damaging the spinal column. And this is kind of a dislocation injury. We've had movement forward. Movement forward. That was a little easier to see. Of this entire vertebra, which causes pressure in this area and this area here from the bend of the spinal column. Now swelling can occur and we can have devastating things occurring to the cerebral, to the uh, uh, C-spine area, or central spinous process or, or the spine. Green stick fractures are incomplete fractures that occur in children due to the flexibility of the skeleton. So their bones are flexible and whenever they, they don't break completely, like an adult's bones are more, uh, they'll break. They're more rigid, if you will. There's not as much flexibility into them. A child's arm can literally bend for a while before it breaks. Now, they still have pain and they still have swelling in that area, but very simply, the bone is not completely broken through. 
Uh, pediatric bony anatomy is unique due to the presence of growth plates. So each one of these plates here that we see in the red have epithelial lines. And those epithelial plates will grow in the two directions uh, as the child grows. Um, very simply, we can get traumatic injuries of these that will cause Salter Harris fractures and cause these growth plates to break or slip depending on how intrusive they are. Burns, thermal burns, accidental trauma. And this would be from like flames, heated objects, scalding water or grease, or accidentally, uh, the child accidentally brings upon themselves non-accidental trauma, scalding water, lit cigarette butts and lighters. And this would be from abuse causes. Uh, burn grading is used by a modified rule of nines. And we'll take a look at that here in just a second. So this is aged base. There's no way you can put this to memory. You can attempt, but very simply, keep the chart with you. Now, they make nice little EMS field guides that have this in there. So just from those three ranges right there, on the head at birth is worth 19%, and when you're 17 and at five years, 14. Whereas as we continue up with this, it gets closer and closer to nine. So at 10 years old, 11%. 15 years old, it's actually at 9%. And as an adult, it's actually worth 8 And this is a modified uh, rule of nines chart. Physiological considerations. The child must be calmed and treated. Please, you may also have to calm the caregivers, uh, that, whether that's mom and dad, other siblings, and so on. Once the scene once they're on scene with uh, all of this detrimental stuff going on, they may be overwhelmed and overly, overly emotional. You, they are your patients as well. Um, psychological effects on severe trauma can continue past the injury and treatment. Immediately after the injury, we generally get regression. After hospitalizations, we get emotional instability. The best approach to care is remain calm, remain soothing, and reassure. Do the best you can for as many as you can. History, mechanism of injury, should give you clues from the scene and bystanders of what actually occurred. Injury timing, the injury may not be apparent at the time, but it may progress in transit. Keep looking and keep reassessing your patient for trending. Potential of energy, no matter how significant, if we think that this might have occurred, we're going to err in the favor of our patient. Pain location, please use the OPQRST mnemonic. Past history, medical, surgical interventions of any sort in the past medical history, medications, allergies, any loss of consciousness, changes from the baseline, etc. Restraint and safety gear use. Note whether they were used properly. Examination. Focus on the airway, breathing, and circulation. And conditions require uh, in the ABCs, if there's any of the conditions that would require immediate attention, like let's say that they had an open sucking chest wound or needed ventilation, get on the ABCs very quickly. Uh, children do not deal with decompensation well. Uh, head to toe examination after life threatening conditions improve. Modify based on emotional age and very simply they need to be trauma naked so that you can see, but there may be some modesty issues. So just we'll kind of work through that. Expose as environmentally appropriate. If it's 20 below zero outside, it is not appropriate to completely expose your patient. Try to get them in the back of the box and then expose them and do your examination. Especially if they have a lot of warm uh, clothing on. Assessment. Key. Identify shock early and intervene aggressively. Step it up if you need to. An example of this is, is instead of starting an IV, you may go directly to the IO, depending on if you think that you can get one in or not. And that also depends on the presentation of your patient. Prevent decompensation at all costs. Pediatric patients' ability to compensate very well, and then they decompensate, circle the drain, and go into a systole. This is largely due to the increased sensitivity of the pediatrics blood vessels to circulating catecholamines. Catecholamines don't work, they can't shut towards the core, and they kind of just fall off the edge of the cliff. A pediatric trauma score is used to gauge the amount of trauma that the pediatric has, has taken, uh, computed by adding the scores for individual categories. In treatment, 
Maintain a patent airway. It may require support. Maintain neutral position. If we're having a hard time getting a neutral inline position, kids need to be placed in a sniffing position. A folded towel or small blanket underneath the shoulders might be adequate. Adequate oxygen and ventilation. Uh, any impediment of this whatsoever, like say a tension pneumothorax, get on the treatment of the tension pneumothorax. A needle chest decompression procedure for pediatric patients is similar to that as is similar to adults. Uh, the needle length and catheter should be shorter. Adequate perfusion. Normal saline boluses support circulation and 20 milliliters per kilogram is the amount of fluid that we're going to give them. Evaluation. <clears throat> Injured pediatric patient transport, monitor and recess, especially if there's been any kind of compromise to the ABCs, continuously monitor that. Tension pneumothorax, shock, or anything of that, uh, of that level, please continuously reassess Q2 minutes. Early detection and aggressive intervention are the keys to caring for the critically ill child. Ill, critically Ill child. Disposition. Significant injury. Transport to the closest pediatric capable trauma center that would have a wide variety of services. Uh, isolated single system injury. Transport to non-pediatric trauma facilities depending on regional capabilities. Here, both our level 1 and our level 2 for pediatric is the same location. Conclusion. The critically injured child presents unique challenges, different than those of the adult patient. The physiology must be thought of. Psychosocial issues may be there as well. Uh, be thorough, oxygenate, oxygenate, and oxygenate, and be sure that you have adequate and good perfusion. If you have any questions concerning this topic, feel free to give me a call. My name is Roy Smith, Smith R at SamaritanEMSOK.com or 405-492-8243. Thank you.